I was probably 26 and newly married to my high school sweetheart, Martin. I had just taken a job at a church as a worship leader. I had no idea what I was doing. I, had, I mean, I had grew up in the church. I'd grown up in the church. I had been a music major, but uh, it was my definitely my first time on staff at a church and okay. trying to figure out what what am I supposed to be doing here. So I go to this worship conference up at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. We are on on break and we're all we're about to head uh, somewhere to eat lunch. And so I'm with two of my coworkers from the church. And I get a call from Martin, my husband. Martin had, he had always been like super healthy athlete, all of that. But over the past few months, he had had just, he had been more lethargic and a little bit forgetful. Uh, and so we're thinking, you know, maybe you have mono, maybe you're just really tired. Mm -hmm. So he, he had had a doctor's appointment, but I didn't go with him because I wasn't, first of all, I was scheduled to be out of town. Secondly, I, we weren't thinking anything major. And so he calls and I answer and, hey, how is your doctor's appointment? And he said, I have a brain tumor. Mm. And I mean, talk about uh, a pivotal moment. You know, when you, when you marry someone super healthy or, and, and you've had a fairly normal life already, those brain tumor were probably the two last words I would have ever guessed would kind of come out of his mouth or would yeah. have ever guessed would have been part of our story. Mm -hmm. So that as far as moments, that would be it. Yeah. So what was your faith like at that time? Were you, I mean, you'd been in church a while, you'd been doing min music ministry, not that you can ever be prepared for getting that kind of news, but were you in a place of strength in your, in your faith at that uh, time? Actually, I was, you know, I, uh, we had just come on staff. Uh, I say we, cause you know, we, we moved from Spartanburg, South Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia to be part of a church called Perimeter Church. And they were the ones that uh, had sent me to the conference. Apparently I was doing so well. They were like, Hey, you need to go learn how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> we're willing to pay money for you to go learn to do what you're supposed to be doing here. But I, um, the church we had come to be part of is a, is a church that actually we, we had been familiar with through the college ministry that my husband had been on staff with. And Perimeter has always been very much discipleship, very much life on life uh, ministry. So yes, on, in some ways I was at a, at a great place spiritually, brand mm -hmm. new job, fairly new husband and, uh, doing great, but on a, on a whole other level, you know, you don't really know how strong your faith is until you actually have to use your faith. <laughs> yeah. I've always thought I'm really good at being a, like a woman of faith right until God calls me to do something that requires faith. And then I realize, <laughs> oh wait, maybe it wasn't quite as strong as what I thought. Right. Uh, but this was one of those situations. So at first, you know, we get the news. I uh, in, I left the conference early. Went and uh, it was it was interesting. I golly, I've not thought about this in so long. I'm so glad we're talking about this. the The guys dropped me at the airport. I had a friend that was trying to find me a flight to fly me home. When the guys dropped me at the airport, I left my cell phone in their car. Oh man! And they didn't realize it. And so I get to the airport and I'm just having this moment where my mind's just kind of been blown and there's not a sink. I, I have no way to call oh, anyone. Wow. And I look back on it and I think that is exactly where I needed to be. I needed to, for, for what was about to happen, I needed to sit there and just talk to the Lord about it. And mm. that's kind of what I did. I just kind of sat there for a little while and and you ask, so what was my faith like? At first, I just knew that God was going to bring us through it. I knew mm -hmm. we were going to be fine. You know, my husband has uh, is a strong believer, was then, still is now. And uh, But I also really had no idea what it was that I had just been told. To yeah. me, brain tumor was, oh, he has a brain tumor. We need to have surgery. He's going to have it removed. And then we are going to kind of get back on track to the perfect life that we've envisioned for ourselves. 
And so as that process began to unfold and Martin did have the surgery, we thought he was going to be in the hospital for a couple of weeks recovering. He ended up being there three months wow. because of some complications, because of even um, the surgery that he had as they were removing the tumor was a lot of other damage um, that that was caused either the surgery or the tumor, even the tumor itself Mm -hmm. of trying to get it off of different parts of his brain. And that we still don't really know exactly, exactly what it was, but there was an enormous amount of brain trauma, which meant that medically Martin uh, was, first of all, his pituitary gland was, Mm -hmm. um, they basically went right through it in order to get to the tumor. So he has no pituitary gland, which, uh, affects a whole lot of things. So it was damage to his hypothalamus. And so there was all these, these new, um, some disabilities and some just quirky things about him. And so it took us years to even just learn the balance of medication that he needed, mm. learn um, the new learning methods that he needed. Uh, so today he, he lives with a memory deficit and a vision deficit. And, and I, I kind of go back to when we first heard that that news, I think we were very optimistic and a little bit naive okay. um, because after maybe a matter of two to three years when we began to realize, okay, things aren't going back to normal. Uh, how, what is our life supposed to look like now? How do we continue to believe that God is good even when his good plan for us looks different than we thought? Yeah. Um, and what does it mean that he has this, you know, that he came to bring us life and life abundant. What does this mean for my disabled husband who um, is now facing, he's not facing abundant life, you know, kind of in the here and he's facing limited life. Hmm. Um, Everything about his life has been limited. So we really had to uh, allow God to redefine what it means, what abundant life is, Uh, allow God to redefine for us, what a good, uh, a good plan looks like. You yeah. know, you think about Jeremiah, you know, I know the plans I have for you. Their plans were prosperity, not calamity. Yeah. And it's like, it kind of looks like calamity. <laughs> I'm going to need you, God, to show me um, what, not like American version of prosperity, but what does prosperity look like in the life of someone who lives with a disability? Mm-hmm. So what did you, give me some insight on what the Lord show, had showed you through particularly like this idea of abundant life where, like you said, we do have kind of an Americanized like health, wealth, prosperity, Yeah, uh, you know, that there's, that the healing is kind of simple. Like Mm -hmm. Jesus touched people and they were healed and then they went on with life. And, but sometimes it's more complicated. What did you see about abundant life that maybe changed? Hmm. That's, that's a great question. I think first of all is Yes, realizing that abundance doesn't necessarily mean the great job you thought you were going to get. Martin, he works at the cafe at our church, okay? And he would tell you right now that he loves his job. But for a guy who went to school for computer science and really imagined himself, I mean, was was working on his master's when he got sick, uh, we were more envisioning like a go- a job at Google, you know, yeah. rather yeah. than him um, making sandwiches and and drinks at a cafe. But a lot of the re- a lot of how he has found joy in that has been um, him allowing God to strip away the idol that is work, the mm-hmm. idol that is productivity, the idol that is uh, you know every single one of us. You go to school and you then you get out and you get a good job Mm -hmm. and then you want a better job. You go to graduate school and then you get even better job. And then the more you work hard, the more things just better and better. And there's more money. And and that's just not what, and and a lot of, I mean, you and I are two ladies sitting around talking about this, but I suppose if there was a man in the conversation, they would say, yeah, a lot of our identity as men um, is tied up, not just in work and what I can do, what I can produce, but even my ability to provide for my family. And so that was a tough thing for him as well. But what we've seen, um, first of all, from the, like the work standpoint, God ended up giving me 
a great job. And I'm, I'm a kind of free spirited creative that uh, we normally don't get great jobs. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we Star- <laughs> starving artists didn't like come out of exactly, nowhere. Right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so I kind of envisioned it anyway. I, I never imagined that I would find a church that I could use my, you know, artistic gifts and really serve well here and, and even write songs. And that, that would be how God would provide financially for our family. It's kind of amazing to to sit back and and see okay, you know, it's not that Martin is the provider and it's not that I'm the provider. It's that God is the provider for our family. And yeah. we point to that um with our kids all the time to show no no no, it's only by God's grace that we have any of this. But kind of back to the idea of abundant the of abundant life. You know, we often you know, see in the scriptures how God uses broken people to do extraordinary things through or broken situations to do extraordinary things through. Yes. Um, but so often we, we don't see ourselves as, as part of that and mm-hmm. how we live our abundant life. Cause I truly would say our life is abundant and it's that we thrive as a family, we have a such we have four fantastic kids, um, and we limp along as a family. And I'm learning that you can thrive and limp all at the same time. What do you mean and, by that? Well, it's like you you know sometimes you know whether it's social media or whatever it is gives us this picture of if my family could just be put together enough then yeah. I would have as much joy as, you know, Susie Q, whoever she is, yeah. you know, which, uh, who goes to Pilates every morning and, and, you know, does these juice fasts, whatever, whatever she does. Um, <laughs> but rather than believing what the scriptures teach us about, um, Paul learning to boast in his weakness, mm, Paul yeah. learning to b- boast in his thorn and I'm not just talking about like disability kind of thorn and weakness, because I'd say um, for Martin, his his kind of disability is 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 very um, tangible. Where I have my own thorns, I have my own propensities. Where I am so prone to try to be strong, you know, whether it's basing it on my gifts, my ability to handle a situation well. When really all the Lord is asking us to do is come to him with our weakness and ask him to be the strength that we need him to be in that situation. And I know that sounds very, um, I don't know if that sounds too, too figurative, but I, I'd say an example would be, you know, as a mom, our li- <laughs> as a mom with four kids and a disabled husband, our lives, they're just different. You would look at us and go, y'all are wacko. You're just crazy. You know? <laughs> and, um, oh my gracious, I could tell you stories that like the other day I was at church and I had, I had asked Martin to, to bring a couple of the kids with him. So, cause sometimes when I go early, he'll Uber. And I just assumed that he understood that I meant Ubering. We live about two miles from the church. Um, someone shows up to church before him and says, Hey, I just saw your, your kids on the highway and they're on their bikes. <gasps> And I was like, you saw oh, no. what? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and my husband, who bikes to work every day, you know, it's one thing for my husband to bike. It's another thing for him to bring a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old on a bike <laughs> on the highway. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, wow. And it's just, it was, it was, okay. They, and they, they show up and they had had a blast. D- yeah. Instead of Ubering, we just decided to ride our bikes Jump to church. Bikes. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, you know, this is not normal. Like, I'm, and and you can't even think about what all these other pa- moms are thinking about sure. me. Yeah, you just say, you know, they're safe, they're fine. Um, but it's it's things like that where you just end up letting go of what you thought life was going to look like. As a mom, I can't because of our situation. I cannot be the perfect mom. Okay. Yeah. It's just not even possible. I'm not going to always bring the organic uh, cookies to the play date that I made out of the wheat that I threshed at my house. You know, like it's right. just not going to happen. 
But here's the thing that's cool about it is the more you realize I can't be the perfect mom, you realize my kids didn't need a perfect mom in the first place. What my kids need is a broken mom. What my kids need is a mom who shows dependence on a perfect God. Mm. Because what I'm teaching my kids is, hey, you don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is learn to accept your weakness, accept your brokenness, and to depend on a perfect God. So when I fail, I, I apologize so much to my kids. I mean, I make them apologize to me as well. But there's a lot of mutual <laughs> repentance happening um, because at the end of the day, it's more important for them to know um, that we can both run to a gracious God yeah. um, who loves them unconditionally. And, you know, as a parent, like do you, one thing that I pray for my kids is that they would have a real encounter with the Lord for themselves mm-hmm. because, you know, as a kid who was raised in church and didn't really get it until like much later in yeah. life, like I'm so aware of the danger of being like around Christian things and hearing lots of Bible stories and like it being like great, you know, like, like yeah, not even coming close to really registering or being something it's like, okay, that's nice. It's mom and dad go to church. Like I, so I, I love that you, you said that because that's, that is what kids need. They need to see parents who are dependent on the Lord. They need to see that faith matters more than just uh, a set of rules we follow or don't follow or a a political party or uh, things we do or don't like, it can't be about all that or kid. That's what kids grow up and they're like, why am I'm done? I put in my time or or even, it's, it's also about how we talk to our kids about the Bible. When we talk to them about, uh, so be like David, a man after guns and heart, or be like Moses and, you know, liberate others, be like Noah and believe God before there's even, even a raindrop, you know, all those kind of things. Um, it's basically saying, get out there and be good. Right. Rather than pointing to the brokenness and just the flawed nature of all of these Bible characters, the mm-hmm. theme of every single hero of the Bible is that they're not the hero of the Bible. <laughs> that's, that's literally right. the point right. is that Jesus is the only hero that there is in the Bible. And Jesus came because we can't. Yeah. Jesus came to be that perfect person because we weren't. Yeah. Uh, and showing our kids um, that the very, you know, the very essence of the gospel is God came and gave his son for sinners. So there's the savior and the sinner, and I'm certainly not the savior, so I must be the sinner. And that's okay. It's okay to, yeah. to acknowledge the wrong that we've done, acknowledge the imperfections we have, because we have a savior um, that that will stand in that gap for us. Yeah. The, the song The song that people most know of yours, obviously, Blessings. Do you... You ever get tired of singing that song? Oh, that, that's a good question. I, I don't, and it's not, I don't, but not because I just love getting up every night singing, you know, to people. It really is. If I never sang it again, if, if I never heard myself sing it again, I'd be okay with it. The, the greater, the greater gain of that song for me has been that it wasn't a song, you know, as songwriters, how do I put it? As songwriters, sometimes there's this misconception that I have mastered this set of truths. Now I'm going to impart them to you <laughs> through my song. Right. And, you know, as if like an author that writes a book on a subject uh-huh. that they've, you know, now I'm an expert. Scholar in. Be now I'm an expert. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but the funny thing about the song Blessings is that God gave me those ideas far before I understood really what I was singing about. Um, I think because he knew that for the next decade, those were the truths that he knew that I needed to sing night after night. Yeah. And my healing of just the, the grief of Martin's brain injury, the grief of what we've gone through, what we, continue to go through um, those were the truths that were going to point me towards Jesus um, along this journey 
Snapshot Testimony is a movie radio podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review or comment. Your feedback really helps us reach more listeners. Plus, I really like hearing what you have to say. I'm your host, Allie Domerson, and together we're sharing the moments that shape a life of faith in Christ.